Okay, thank you all for coming out here tonight. Um, one thing that most of you don't realize, we have a consulting arm at the Da Vinci Institute called the Visionarium, and we help work, uh, help companies work through different uh, scenarios uh, about thinking about the future. And so I'll take you through some of these, these techniques we use here tonight. But we're a very backward looking society. We're backward looking because it's just human nature. It's just part of who we are. Um, because we've all personally experienced the past. When we look around us, we see evidence of the past all around us. All information that we get is essentially history. So the past is very knowable, and yet we're gonna be spending the rest of our lives in the future. So it's almost as if we're walking backwards into the future. As a futurist, my job is to turn people around, to give them some idea of what the future might hold. So what do we know about the future? We know the future is constantly unfolding. It's relentless. It's gonna happen whether we want it to or not. It's one of nature's greatest forces. The future's gonna happen whether or not we agree to participate. You should try it sometime. Say, I'm not gonna go into the future. <laughs> yeah, good luck on that one. The future's in control. If your next project is not aligned with the problems, needs, and desires of the future, the future's gonna kill it. I always give these human attributes to the future. So, um, notice I said the problems, needs, and desires of the future, not of the present, not of the past. So how do we align ourselves with the future? The question we should be asking is, what does the future want? So before I answer that question, I have to tell you about my crystal ball. As a, a futurist, I get asked a lot if I have a crystal ball, and yes, I do have a crystal ball. And uh, it was just sitting around at home, and my wife says, why don't you just take that to the office because it's just gathering dust here. So reluctantly, I said, okay, and I put it in the car, and I was no more than you know, four or five minutes down the road, and I looked over, and I saw that my crystal ball had started a fire on the seat next to me. This is this <laughs> giant lens, the sun shining in. This is like a Boy Scouts 101. I should have known better. <laughs> Luckily, I was able to put out the fire, and it didn't cause any serious damage, but then I had this revelation, and obviously it came from my crystal ball that the newspaper headlines the next day were going to say, Futurist killed by his own crystal ball. <laughs> and he didn't see it coming. Um, you know, that's like the ultimate insult for a, a futurist. Larry Page says that the main reasons companies fail is because they miss the future. I happen to agree with that. So when we ask this question, what does the future want? Let's change this question around a little bit to how does the future get created? Well, the future gets created in the minds of everybody around us. People make decisions today based on their understanding of what the future holds. So I use this phrase, the future creates the present. This is just the opposite of what most people think. Most people think that what we're doing today is gonna to create the future, but from a little different perspective, it's the things that we're doing today that are gonna to create, uh, it's these decisions we make today based on our understanding of the future uh, are gonna create the, the future. So our visions of the future determine our actions today. If we change people's visions of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. And I'm gonna change your vision of the future. I'm gonna change it so when you walk out of here today, you're gonna to be making different decisions. Who in your mind is the most famous person in the world? In the non-religious sense. Just, just shout out a name. Who do you think is the most famous person in the world? Robert Williams. Robert Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Bieber, okay. <laughs> All right, we're getting, we're getting skewed off in weird directions here tonight. <laughs> Edison, okay. <laughs> um, since we run the Da Vinci Institute, we had Da Vinci on our list, so uh, <laughs> that, that one seemed a little obvious. But uh, people like Columbus or Nelson, Man Nelson Mandela, uh, Isaac Newton, um, uh, Einstein, Edison, 
um, Gandhi, maybe Oprah. Um, actually, I thought about this for a while, and I think actually the most famous of all times is probably Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> it's fictional. Um, He's religious, it doesn't count. Oh, he is religious. <laughs> ah, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but after I thought about this for a while, it, uh, it occurred to me that the most famous person of all times probably hasn't been born yet, or we don't know who that person is. Now, this should be a very inspiring thought to everybody here, because there's an opening. You could become that person. So then the next logical question is, is what is the accomplishment that will make that person the most famous? Another way of asking this question is, what are the big things that still need to be accomplished in the world? Ah, there's lots of them. So I'm going to take you through a scenario, and I'm going to loop around back to this, this topic here. The year is 2020, and the people at the Norwegian Nobel Committee decide they want to change the process for selecting the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. So with the introduction of this new secure web-based voting system, they decide they want to hold a global election. They want the people of the world to decide this. They got beat up pretty bad in the past for some of the people they selected. So they want to uh, they want to change it up a little bit, and so their goal is to inspire a new age of peace, and they want to use this process to help with that. You know, they have a peace mandate, and uh, so they select the first of the four nominees, and it's announced 60 days before before the election, and it's a 24-hour election cycle here. So votes can be cast through any electronic device. Now they have a peace mandate. Uh, using a process like this can actually help inspire peace around the world. So because of this mandate, they don't want people to just select somebody that's on the list. They want to pre-test them to make sure that they know something about each of these candidates. So they ask two rudimentary questions about each of the candidates and each person gets four attempts. It's not designed to trip people up, it's just designed to force people to learn a little bit more about the candidates. In the end, the winner's announced, 740 million votes are cast by people in 50 different countries, and the winner suddenly becomes the most famous person in the world. Is this a realistic scenario? Some of you will say yes, and some of you will say no. This is, uh, when you look at a technology like this, this is a new technology, global elections. We haven't had this option in the past. Other applications might be selecting the Time Magazine Person of the Year, uh, the site of the next Olympics or the next World Cup. Probably wouldn't be Qatar. Um, <laughs> but there's ways of doing things wrong. We could push the limits here. Um, Somebody might decide we want to select a new world leader. Yeah, that's not going to go over well. Or maybe voting on who owns the moon. <laughs> yeah, not a good, good idea. But there's lots of regional issues that could be decided. It's the can we, should we question that keeps coming up. Uh, should we ban plastic bottles all over the world? Should this island that's in the middle of the Pacific, should it go to Japan or should it go to China? Uh, lots of issues like that. But at what point do the number of votes constitute a new global mandate? When we have 700 million people in the world weigh in on a topic, shouldn't the global leaders pay attention to this? So there's lots of questions that come out of something like this. And the last one here is, will it create new industries? And to that I have to say, yes, it will. This is what I refer to as catalytic innovation, which is different than disruptive innovation. We hear a lot about disruptive innovation. Examples in the past of catalytic innovation, um, these are ones that create entire new industries. Uh, electricity, automobiles, airplanes, telephones, photographs. These have all gone on to create multi-billion dollar industries. But here's the thing, all industries are a bell curve. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's right, all industries end. And most industries today 
are in the second half of the bell curve. They're being forced to do more with less. And that's where we find ourselves today. Lots of big industries. And I'll use this example of peak steel. Uh, we could talk about peak oil, but that's very controversial. Peak steel is projected to happen somewhere around 2024. This is the, the year when we reach the peak demand for steel. We come up with lots of composite materials and the demand for steel starts to decline. Now there's a, a parallel bell curve here. Uh, the peak employment for that industry happened in the 1980s. Um, we actually had three times as many people working in the steel industry in the 1980s as we do today, yet we're producing far more steel. So the peak employment actually becomes a lead indicator as an eventual decline in uh, the overall demand for that goods or service, whatever that industry has. As my favorite physicist Max Planck likes to say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. We have a lot of people who are, uh, when we talk about, we all have our own way of influencing the future. There's some people who have way more influence than most of us. And I'll mention just a few of them here. Uh, Mark Andreessen says that software is eating the world. Kevin Kelly, through technology, we're engineering our lives and bodies to be more quantifiable. I'll tell you why that's important here in a bit. Pete Diamani says that uh, we're headed from a world with 2 billion people connected to the internet in 2010 to 7 billion by 2020. I'll explain how that's gonna happen. Vinod Kosla, who happens to be the most successful venture capitalist of all times, he says that big data is going to eliminate the need for 80% of all doctors. Is that good news or bad news? Or <laughs> Clayton Christensen predicts that by 2019, half of all K through 12 classes are going to be taught online. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as well. Christian Hammond says that by 2030, 90% of all the news is going to be written by computers. Chris Anderson says 3D printing is going to be bigger than the internet. And after all of these people making all these statements, I didn't want to be left out, so I came up with the prediction <laughs> <laughs> that by 2030, over 2 billion jobs are going to go away. Now this isn't intended to be a doom and gloom statement that we're all going to be unemployed. It is intended to be a wake-up call though, because we're going to be turning over our jobs faster than ever before in history. And so we need to create systems to create new jobs very quickly. This is what I refer to as the level problem. And I got the inspiration for the level problem from my friend Dave over here. He, he explained this to me. See, most of us have this tool in our garage called the Level. But once we download this mobile app, the Level app, then suddenly we don't need to buy this tool. That means that we don't need people to make the metal frame for it. We don't need people to make the little glass bulbs for it. We don't need people to assemble it, ship it, and receive it. We don't need stores to carry it. It means that every time we download a mobile app, a little piece of a job goes away. Not very much, but a little piece. But when we download millions of mobile apps, we're eliminating lots of jobs. Now that's just one example. We're automating lots of jobs out of existence. In the process, we're freeing up human capital. But just because there aren't enough jobs doesn't mean we're gonna run out of work. I mean, that's kind of ludicrous. I mean, suddenly there's no work left to do in the world? Yeah, I don't buy that. But what is it we're supposed to be doing? And where will our next generation jobs come from? Now, I wrote a paper recently on this topic of the laws of exponential capabilities. And I'm going to step you through some of the thinking on this because each time we create more sophisticated technology, we create more capabilities. So the first law is that with automation, every exponential decrease in effort creates an equal and opposite exponential increase in capabilities. So let me explain that a little bit. I'll explain it through the distance we travel in our lifetime. In 1850, the average 
transportation speed was four miles an hour. And you do a little math and that works out to that the average person traveled about 73,000 miles in their lifetime. 1900, it went up to eight miles an hour. 1950, 24 miles an hour, that tripled. Then by 2000, a lot of us were traveling, so it went up to 75 miles an hour uh, traveling by airplane. Um, and then by 2050, the rough projection is, is that we should be traveling on average at 225 miles an hour, and that over our lifetime we'll go not 73,000 miles, but 7.3 million miles. That's a dramatic increase in capability. If we look at that, I um, had to throw in a tube transportation slide here too. <laughs> um, if we look at it from a little different perspective, the number of photographs taken continues to ramp up exponentially. So the very first photograph was taken in 1826. At least that's the, the first one that we, ha we know about. Now we've done some rough math on it and the number of photos taken every year is roughly 1.3 trillion photos every year are taken. Um, amazing increase in capabilities just through photography. Law number two, as today's significant accomplishments become more common, mega accomplishments will take their place. So, um, recreating our infrastructure, uh, these are some of the big, big things that we, we need to apply our, our energies to. Uh, space industries, controlling the weather, reaching the center of the earth. Um, things like controlling gravity, viewing the past, traveling at the speed of light, inexhaustible power supplies. These are all things that still need to be accomplished. Law number three, as we raise the bar for our achievements, we also reset the norm for our expectations. So this is a, a photo I like a lot because it shows the difference between Toy Story 1, the animation used in Toy Story 1 and Toy Story 3, 15 years later. Now, the, for the average person going to the movies, you probably don't notice the difference, but it is seriously uh, more sophisticated, and so we're ra raising the level of our expectations. We don't even know it. So, when we look at the laws of exponential capabilities, you know, printing has gone from huge printing presses to desktop everything. Music, we've gone from crude recording studios to symphonies we create at home. Magazines, uh, now we can read them any publication anywhere, anytime. Highways have gone from dirt roads to very sophisticated concrete interstates. Um, telecom, from wires everywhere to wireless everything. Water systems from aqueducts to running water everywhere. Food supplies from farmer markets to super grocery stores. Emergency services from makeshift fire brigades to very sophisticated emergency rescue teams. All of these we're taking for granted now. We've ramped up our capabilities. So it's all about future industries. That's where the jobs are coming in. And so how will future industries change our vision of the future? I'm gonna go through a few of these future industries here. Um, when Mark Andreessen talks about software eating the world, it really is. We're creating this digital information layer over everything physical. A lot of it's happening with the Internet of Things. And there's this interesting category of the Internet of Things that's coming out right now that I find fascinating. Uh, it's what's called enchanted objects. Um, and I'll talk just briefly about some of these enchanted objects. This is the Amazon trash can. Uh, anything we throw into this trash can, it scans the barcode and it reorders it from Amazon. Um, that's kind of a proprietary trash can, I understand. <laughs> uh, this is a, a Memo Me smart mirror. So you can be trying on different clothes and you can compare what you look like to what you were wearing just a little bit ago um, in a side-by-side -side comparison. That's kind of interesting. Vitality glow caps. These are pill caps 
uh, for your pills that if you forget to take your pills in the morning, it starts flashing, and then it starts chirping, and then it'll text you. Um, so it's, it's, it's got this nagging feature built into it. <laughs> uh, the ambient umbrella. Um, it actually is looking at the weather forecast, and on your way out of the house, it'll tell you whether or not you need to take your umbrella with you. And it does that by flashing lights on the bottom of it. And that, I think, is pretty cool. This is the ambient orb. Um, this is one you can set for various things. You can set it for different stock markets, and it changes color based on whether things are going good or going bad. Um, and so it'll alert you based on some color signals that it gives off. The biometric coffee maker, this thing is really smart. You get up in the morning, you put your hand on it, it knows exactly how much caffeine should go in your coffee. <laughs> it knows how much sweetener should go into your coffee. We don't know if it has a Jack Daniel switch, but maybe it should have that as well. Uh, the Pinto feed pet feeder. Um, so if you're at work, you can you can dispense food for your pet. And then you can FaceTime your pet at home while they're eating, which seems like a cool thing to do. So if you have pets stranded at home and you're not FaceTiming them, then shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the instant mood fireplace. Not only does it know if you're in the mood for a fire in your fireplace and turn it on, it knows what color the flame should be. That is so critical. All right, another industry, cryptocurrencies. This I find totally fascinating. I wrote an article recently on, uh, on this about creating the, the central bank of Bitcoin. Uh, should we actually be creating a central bank for Bitcoin? This is just the opposite of what the kind of the libertarian mindset of of Bit, the founders of Bitcoin were thinking, but let's talk about it a little bit. Assuming that someday we're going to have a global currency, should it or could it be Bitcoin? Bitcoin was started in, in January of 2009. It's an anonymous cryptocurrency. Uh, it's mined into existence. Um, just as reference, the, the money, the national money, is loaned into existence. This is mined into existence. It's a little bit different. This is a, a Bitcoin mining operation, um, and it uses all these quirky words, the blocks, the hash, the nonce, and the proofs of work. Um, a lot of people have invested a lot of money in mining operations. Um, there's 21 million possible Bitcoins, and 62% of them have been mined already. Um, now, I, I, I thought that that wasn't nearly enough money for a, a global currency until I found that each Bitcoin can be subdivided into 100 million bits. So that gives the equivalent of 2,100 trillion total Bitcoin particles, or I don't know what you call them. <laughs> um, but in the whole world of cryptocurrencies, I just I found it amazing to learn that there's over a thousand cryptocurrencies in existence right now. In fact, there was 26 new cryptocurrencies introduced last week. And there's this, this online calendar where you can go in and you can see which currencies are being introduced on which days. 27 cryptocurrencies right now have a market cap over a million dollars. Bitcoin happens to be at $6.2 billion this is the market cap. These are the top 10. Ripple, as an example, over $500 million uh, market cap. And some of these, Peercoin, Darkcoin, Dogecoin, I don't know how you pronounce that. Um, these are all worth over a million dollars. Isn't that kind of cool? You can kind of print your own money. Why aren't we all doing that? <laughs> we have a lot of competitors. There's a thousand people out there competing with us right now. <laughs> Some of the problems with cryptocurrencies is that there's no legal system for it. If there's a dispute of any kind, there's no default court system or legal system to go to to, to resolve it. 
Um, there's no dependent constituency, which means that they don't, uh, they don't have an obligation to anybody. They, uh, they don't have any author higher authority, if you will. There's, uh, there's no overall economic responsibilities. Um, they don't care if the economy in Armenia is going bad. Um, that's, not their, that's not their concern. But coexistence is a key thing. Uh, they don't want to declare war on existing currencies. That's, that's a big deal. So I, I put together the three, these three brief scenarios. Um, how long before a person can live for an entire year using no other money other than Bitcoin? I think that's a good question. How long before someone be able to take out a home loan or a car loan or a business loan on cryptocurrency? We can't do that right now. How long before somebody can walk into like a Walmart or Target and buy a $10 or $100 Bitcoin card that can be redeemed online? So Bitcoin right now is kind of the equivalent of the ARPANET back in the 70s or 80s, somewhere in that time frame. It's evolving quickly though. Um, they, they have a way of automating authority out of existence. Um, so there's, there's good sides and bad sides to this, but they're, they're flourishing. Um, is this a friend or a foe? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think we have to contend with this because they're working their way into existence and they have value apparently. Um, so we're going to be doing a night with a futurist in October on the topic of cryptocurrency. So we've got a, a true expert, not me, a pseudo expert on it. But <laughs> and so we'll be able to ask him all the tough questions. The smart home technology. Um, there's actually a real interesting battle going on right now with the platforms for smart homes. Uh, Google actually bought the Nest thermostat so they would hatch, have a beachhead in the home to uh, attach lots of other devices to. Apple is trying to use it through Apple TV. Um, uh, Lowe's hardware is doing it through Iris and Amazon's trying to do it through their television box. And so all of them want a beachhead in the home for all of these gadgets that we're going to be putting into our homes. Uh, smart lighting is, is a good one so we can control all of our lighting go from this type of lighting to this type of lighting just instantly. Um, biometric door locks, we can let the people we want in but keep everybody else out. Uh, smart mirrors in our uh, house that tell us what we need to know for the day. Uh, smart pet doors that will let our pets come and go but it'll keep all the skunks and the raccoons out. Um, things that monitor babies, these things are becoming very smart. Um, they can tell the temperature of the head, whether or not the chest is moving. And then um, the plant walls like this, not just talking to our plants anymore, but our plants talk back. If you forget to water them, they're going to send you a Facebook post or they're going to send you a tweet. <laughs> they're going to start whining. <laughs> all right, written by robots. 90% of all the news is going to be written by computers in 2030. It may surprise you that a lot of the news is already written by computers. Uh, a lot of the, the stock market reports, a lot of high school basketball games and football games. These are really boring jobs if you're a writer to write these articles. Now we have computers that can do it all. Christian Hammond's actually thinking that by 2030, some of our best-selling novels are gonna be written by computers. Probably won't look like this, but, uh, but something similar. The quantified self. When Kevin Kelly came up with this phrase, he's actually created this whole new industry about the quantified self. The quantified self has to do with our ability to accurately measure all the inputs and outputs of the human body. We can very accurately measure the quality of the air that we're breathing, the quality of water that we're drinking. and the chemical composition of sweat that's showing up on our arm. And we're doing it through lots of these wearable devices that are coming in in all shapes and forms. Um, and this is creating lots of problems. Device addiction is a big one. There's actually a study that came out recently that said that one in three people would rather give up sex than their phone. 
Um, so if you look at the people sitting next to you, <laughs> if it's not them, <laughs> Uh, Hyper-awareness, it doesn't get talked about too much, but we are, we're so much more aware of everything going on in the world right now. Uh, somebody releases a new, port in Mex a new report in Mexico or uh, Moscow or Tokyo, the rest of the world knows about it 10 minutes later. Um, and all of this wearable technology, whether it's Google Glass or whether it's uh, other things, are giving us the ability to understand the world around us much better, that increased awareness. These are smart contacts. Um, yes, I know if you're looking across the table at your boyfriend or girlfriend and you see these in their eyes, it's a little different experience. <laughs> but this is very sophisticated technology. It's uh, lots of information coming and going. Um, and uh, there's actually uh, Google's testing out measuring the glucose levels with these devices. Uh, there's speculation that with graphene contact lenses that we'll actually be able to see in the dark. Now, I think this is a really cool technology if I could do it and nobody else could do it. <laughs> I would like that. It gives me an advantage. So the way this works is smart contacts. They would get these information overlays. So you see this plate of food in the top left corner up there, and then uh, it would give you information about the nutritional value of the food, how much you weighed before you ate that plate of food, and how much you're gonna weigh afterwards. And then in the bottom right corner, there is a coupon there. That's just fundamentally wrong. There should not be any coupons in your eye. When Vinod Kosla talks about big data is gonna eliminate the need for 80% of all doctors, he's actually talking about these type of um, smart devices, that little bandage that you put on your skin that have tons of little sensors in, lots of information coming and going there, and very flexible things. And then we have the latest generation that we can actually print on our skin there. And so it's like a, a printed tattoo that goes on our skin. And so for those of you who know about the printed tattoos, they have, the newest ones have a feature where you can, it's a turn on, turn off feature. I happen to think that a lot of people should turn off their tattoos, but <laughs> <laughs> that's just me. So this is all part of the quantified self. This is our ability to measure all the inputs and outputs of the human body, uh, which is getting far more sophisticated with all of these devices. Um, just from one year to the next at CES in Las Vegas, there's a tenfold increase in the number of wearable devices. Um, in the future, we're also going to be able to monitor all of the information that's coming and going from our brain. Uh, Larry Page says that in the future, Google software will be able to understand what you're knowledgeable about and what you're not. Is that a scary thought? Um, <laughs> Yeah, he thought it was kind of cool when he said it, but... But we're getting into this whole area of brain hacking. Can we actually make people smarter faster? Uh, this transcranial brain stimulation uh, that's being experimented with is actually shown that we can double learning speeds. I like that idea. Uh, I don't know if I want to try it on myself, but I'd like to try it on somebody else. <laughs> The 3D printing world is happening around us so fastly. This is a statue of Michelangelo. It took uh, this statue of David carved by Michelangelo. It took him four years to carve this out of solid marble. Today, we could recreate this with 3D printers in less, less than two days. In the past, we create a presidential bust, and they would, the way it was done is they would actually have to create this face mask, and they would they would put straws up the nose of the president and put a straw in their mouth and they'd put plaster over their face and it would take the president out of commission for almost a day. Um, this is one that was done for Obama just by scanning, uh, scanning him and printing it on a 3D printer. Um, this is Charles Hull. He's the guy that kind of invented the whole 3D printing industry. Um, started with just plastics, but now we've got over 200 printable materials concrete, metals, food. This is one that I found fascinating. It was a combination scanner, 3D printer, fax machine. So you can put a, something in here, scan it, and then fax it to somebody else who has that same piece of equipment. 
And so you can fax objects, not just papers. How cool is that? 3D printing is scaling up, and so it's a matter of uh, time before we scale up to do really big things, and they're already printing cars. Um, sometime in the future, you walk into a clothing store, the first thing you're gonna do is get your body scanned in. Uh, so once you get all the measurements of your body, then all you have to do is look for the colors, the styles, and the, um, uh, everything that you want, and you can print it out. This is Deb standing in front of a smart mirror at CES, and she was, trying on clothes and she could swipe one dress to the next to the next and you can try on a lot of clothes really fast with these and then have it printed out I mean this is a conceptual 3d clothing printer but there's there's clothes that's already being printed these are some 3d printed clothes um, and we can create stuff that you can't create any anyway else um, and some of this clothes takes on a life of its own I refer to this lady as porcupine woman <laughs> she has problems getting close to people. Uh, the fabric today is very coarse, but it's just going to get refined in the future to something more, much more silk-like. And then it's not just clothing, it's also shoes. We can scan in our feet and actually have shoes that fit perfect the first time. Um, I was thinking these would look really good on me. Mm, <laughs> no, probably not. Um, the bottom one here is actually a cast. So if you break your arm, you can get your arm scanned in and have a cast that actually fits and it has holes in it so when you develop all the itchy parts that you can actually scratch yourself. Um, disposable houses. Um, I, I like this, this idea of disposable houses because um, we're, we're too invested in real estate right now and this is, um, they're showing this with ceramics here. This is ceramics printing parts, and it's gonna switch over to printing a wall with fast drying concrete. Now the reason I like this is because it automates this house building process in such interesting ways. And there was, there was a lot of competition going on as to see who could print the first house. Uh, this is fast drying concrete and you can see one layer going on on top of another layer and it, they're essentially printing a wall here and there's this little zigzaggy reinforcement uh, structure in the middle here and as they're they're going through this uh, you can start seeing how easy it is that you could print an entire house very quickly with this well, there's a competition going on, and there's a group, a, a Dutch group, there was one in London, a group in Southern California. But it turned out that it was the, the Chinese who actually mastered it. Not only did they print the first house, they printed 10 houses in one day for an average price of $4,800. <clears throat> now, this first one kind of looks like uh, one of the Monopoly houses, the, the Monopoly game. Um, but some of them were a little more sophisticated. And they printed them all in pieces and they put all the pieces together. Um, now the, the guy who's the CEO who's standing here, he said something real funny because he said that he's been working on this 10 years and he says before they printed all these houses that he printed his entire factory which is around 100,000 square feet of space. Um, he said it took him 30 days. He said that was a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> I find that to be kind of hilarious. Um, but it was a very similar process to what I just showed you on that video. Um, but this idea that we could actually print, set up a machine on a location and print our entire house, this is revolutionizing the way we think about houses. And so the next time you have a hailstorm and it destroys your roof, rather than getting your roof fixed, you may want to just grind up your entire house and reprint it. It may be cheaper. You don't even have to clean the house. You can just reprint it. <laughs> and just after that came out, this is a Sol Slovenian company, Bet Abrams, that came out with the house printer for $16,000. Now they're selling the house printers. I mean, how cool is that? You no longer have a need for flat walls. Every wall becomes an artistic centerpiece. You can you can get very creative with how these walls turn out. Architects are going to have a Haiti with it. They can create these free-form structures that, uh, 
that aspires to the sky that we can't create in any other way today. And we can do it with lots of different material, printing with glass, printing with steel, printing with concrete. We're going to be able to create structures that we've never imagined before. And then we can scale up. It's just a matter of scaling before we can start printing really big things. Can we print a ship? Probably not anytime soon, but sometime in the future, we're going to be able to get to these really big structures, printing a baseball stadium or printing um, a floating island or printing uh, multiple floating islands. I'll take two of them. Um, and then we get into the, the bioprinting. This is printed skin for burn victims, printing a vein for surgery. Um, this is a kid that has a prosthetic arm that he's got had printed. Uh, and we can get very artistic in how we're printing um, legs and arms. This girl here has an exoskeleton that was printed. This gives her a wide range of movement that she never had before. Uh, Lee Cronin is a professor at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, and he's found that you can, uh, this idea of printing pills, and he says that all of our pharmaceutical drugs are composed of just seven basic substances. And so you just put in seven cartridges, and then voila, you can print almost anything. I don't think it's quite that simple, but, um, but it's actually the idea of a pill printer. This is a pill printer that's in Belgium that's being made right now. Not only does it print pills, it prints the packaging for the pills at the same time. I mean, how cool is that? So this isn't quite what Lee Cronin had suggested. He was suggesting that we could, whatever formulation, we could put in a prescription into this machine and spit out a bottle of pills. Uh, lots of bio organs and uh, kidneys and bladders and livers. Um, Craig Ventner says that we're going to be able to print antibodies and new life forms. And so I always wonder how long will it be before we can actually print our uh, replacement body for ourselves. Um, in, in a few years, I would like to move into, you know, like a 20-year-old body, something that looked a lot better. Um, <laughs> So some of, some of the, uh, the obstacles, naturally, I mean, if somebody gets their finger cut off, we don't know how to print a new finger that is attachable and things like that. So we have lots of obstacles in the way still. And then the printed food world, uh, this is coming. Sometime in the near future, you're going to send your spouse out to get a kiwi cartridge and an eggplant cartridge so you can print dinner, dinner tonight. Um, <laughs> This is the, the NASA pizza competition that was done. Uh, the reason NASA is interested in this is because there's no indigenous food supplies on Mars or in, uh, uh, on the moon. And so how do you create variety in the diet? So they had the pizza competition. So these machines are kind of coming out of the woodwork right now. There are lots of different shapes and sizes. This is uh, 3D printed hamburgers, 3D printed chickpea snacks. These are printed raviolis. Uh, corn chips, uh, uh, geometric sugar shapes, um, and at CES you could get your face scanned in and printed in chocolate. I know a lot of you have a secret desire to eat your face in chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about all of the apples that grow on an apple tree, lots of them fall off, they get bruised and damaged, and most of those apples go to waste. But what if you could take that same apple stock and print it into a perfect apple every time. Not only is it a perfect apple, you can also eat the stem and the core and the leaf because it's all printed out of the same material. So would you buy a product in the future that said it was naturally grown, completely organic, printed food? <laughs> is that an oxymoron? So when Chris Anderson says 3D printing is going to be bigger than the internet, the reason he says that is that the economy for the physical world is five to six times larger than the digital world. Uh, so I think it's a, an, an interesting uh, statement there. Uh, the flying drones, we've all heard about Amazon delivering packages. Uh, this is a French company delivering newspapers. This is a burrito bomber. Uh, so you can order burritos and this thing will fly over and it will drop it out with a little parachute and the burrito falls into your waiting arms. Uh, Domino's has her Domino copter. This one is uh, a restaurant that actually has uh, drones that are delivering food right to the table. 
and uh, what could possibly go wrong with chopsticks and <laughs> whirling blades? Uh, but the, the drone that everybody wants, and Mark should pay attention to this, is actually the, the flying beer drone. <laughs> Yeah, em emergency beer drones are going to be real popular. <laughs> um, naturally, the farming world is going to be uh, big on drones in the future, being able to use uh, flyovers to uh, scan for bugs and um, the fertilizer uh, moisture content and things like that. Uh, this is a helicopter drone. Uh, a few passes and you get a lot of information to make good decisions on for your farm. Emergency rescue drones will be real popular here in Colorado. Uh, any avalanche victims, rather than sending people in harm's way, we can send drones to be Johnny on the spot and find where these people are, are trapped. Um, news stations are going to be sending in drones to get uh, to scoop the other stations. Um, anytime there's an incident in a city, the city's first response is going to be to send up drones to get eyes on it and then they can formulate a good response for it. Um, in Colorado though, we should be paying attention to the fact that we could put infrared sensors on these drones and actually scan for forest fires. And when we see a forest fire when it's very small, it's easy to put out. So rather than wait till it turns into a huge blaze like this, we can call in a fire extinguisher drone and put it out right away. Um, when Pete Diamantes talks about going from 2 billion people connected to the internet in 2010 to 7 billion in 2020, he's referring to, this is Titan, the solar powered drone company that these drones fly at 65 to 80,000 feet in the air. Uh, Facebook bought a similar company called Ascenta. Um, we have our own company in Colorado called Bi Aerospace that's doing very similar things. And these will be able to fly above the weather patterns and can create Wi-Fi communications for everybody on the planet Earth. Um, and these never have to come back down again. They, they can stay up for years on end. We don't know what the mean time is between failure, but that's the thinking behind it. Uh, Google took it one step farther and bought Skybox, which is a satellite company. And so they're, um, they're moving big time into space communications. Um, we all know about the driverless cars. Driverless cars are happening very fast around us. This is actually the first one you can buy it today. It's $150,000. Travels 12 miles an hour. Um, it's good for airports and theme parks and things like that. But virtually every car company out there has driverless cars somewhere in the background. Um, not too distant future, you're going to be able to walk out of your front door and pull out your smartphone and say, I want to go shopping, I want to go to work, I want to go to school. A driverless car is going to come and pick you up, take you to where you want to go, drop you off. And from there, it'll pick somebody else up and take them to where they want to go and drop them off. These things will be in constantly in circulation. Car companies are going to shift from the driver experience to the rider experience. Because uh, we won't care about driving the car anymore. Uh, it's driving it for us. These cars all have to talk to each other, and that's what Google is developing an operating system for all these things. But once we're able to actually map out all the hazards on the road, um, we can actually start driving much closer together, side by side, front to back, and then we can drive much faster. Sometime between 2030, 2035, we're gonna see our first driverless cars only road. It's a road that we can only put driverless cars on and cars will be going 150 miles an hour down that road. It eliminates the human variable. In the United States, it eliminates 31,000 deaths each year, uh, 2.5 million injuries, 5.5 million accidents. Um, it gives added freedom to seniors, to uh, children, people without licenses. The baby boom population is going to be demanding driverless cars. Um, we don't want to lose our freedom to get around. This is what an intersection will look like in the driverless car era. <laughs> kind of like India right now, but... <laughs> <laughs> And then actually we're going to go to the ultra high speed once, once we can get Daryl funded here and we can get that off the ground. 
Um, lots of effort going into this whole thinking about tube transportation. Um, this is the, the fifth form of transportation. This takes us to a whole new level. Uh, Elon Musk had proposed the Hyperloop. Um, and once, once he got to talking to Daryl, he decided that uh, Daryl was way farther along than he was. And so this is space travel on Earth. This is the idea of being able to travel over 4,000 miles an hour in these tubes. Um, and uh, so a trip all the way from New York or Washington to Beijing, you could do it in less than two hours for under $100. I mean, how cool is that? So it's not inconceivable to think that in not that distant future that we can have breakfast in London, we can have lunch in, in Tokyo and dinner in LA, um, and we'll be that much of a fluid society. This has the potential to become the largest infrastructure project in the world. We have the potential to actually, uh, as soon as we start building this network, other countries are gonna instantly wanna get added onto it. So this is like a 50 year build out over a trillion dollar investment employing hundreds of millions of people. This is just one infrastructure project that can employ an amazing number of people. And then the last one I'll talk about is future of education. So let's define the problem here. We need to prepare students for jobs that don't exist, <clears throat> using technology that hasn't been invented to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. That pretty well sums it up there. <laughs> so when we talk about where will our next generation jobs come from, when, when Facebook bought Oculus Rift in, in March, um, this, this changed things. It created a band for people that were experts in virtual reality, virtual reality designers, virtual reality developers and engineers. Um, this is an amazing technology. Um, so as a result of this, we suddenly got, oh, thank you, Jessica. Um, as a result of this, we, there was a, a sudden uptick in the demand for these uh, people with this talent. Now for a traditional college to start teaching um, this type of curriculum, you know, they have to create the curriculum, then they have to start getting the students into this pipeline and it's a six to seven year process. And in the meantime, the, the world has changed. The whole world of technology has shifted. Another one was when the, this whole idea of the right to be forgotten. In, uh, um, just a couple months ago, uh, a court in the European Union uh, decided that people have the right to be forgotten. And that instantly triggered uh, demands from Google to take down uh, a quarter million websites. So 70,000 people demanded 250,000 websites be taken down, and that was just the people that figured out how to get to Google. Um, if anybody else knew how to contact them, there would be a lot more. Suddenly, there was this huge increase in demand for reputation management professionals. Well, where do you go to school to do that? How do you learn to do that? Marketing. Um, yeah, some of the marketing. A lot of people are learning it on their own. Again, the, the, the number of jobs, just suddenly there is a huge uptick in the number of jobs. You know, 5,500 jobs when I did a search online. So bold companies are instantly triggering this need for talent, uh, for talented people with skills to align with growing with these cutting edge industries. And we don't have any systems for training people quickly. And that's where micro colleges come into play. Uh, by 2030, the average worker will have to reboot their skills six times. Um, so micro colleges are an immersive form of education done in a short period of time. Um, so it's no longer possible to predict uh, the, the educational needs of business four to five years in advance. Micro colleges are a responsive form of education, a responsive framework for creating this new talent. Uh, at the Da Vinci Institute, we here have the Da Vinci coders and uh, currently we're teaching Ruby on Rails as a programming language and it's a 13-week course. We are scaling up 
to be teaching several other classes here in the near future. We're, we're scaling up to be teaching uh, game design. We're, we're looking at design for 3D printing. Um, there, and there's, there's several other ones. We're teaching other languages, front end and back end programming. And in the end, you get a certificate. Um, the credentialing part is interesting because most of the, the, the coding companies don't really care whether or not you have a degree. Uh, they just care whether or not you can do the job. So micro colleges, the way we're looking at this, can be created in all kinds of different areas, whether it's designing parts for 3D printers or uh, drug, dog breeding universities or crowdfunding certificate programs, drone pilots, uh, becoming a brewmaster, all of these things have interesting potential for a micro college. Uh, intense training in a short period of time. Um, I talked about by 2030 that half of all the traditional colleges are going to disappear and we're seeing lots of the telltale signs of this happening already. Um, in, um, uh, a few months back I was in Istanbul and I gave a talk on teacherless education in one of the TEDx talks I did. Um, afterwards, one of the executives from Google came up to me and he said, you know that teacherless education, we're really interested in that at Google because we want to educate Africa and teachers don't want to go to Africa. Now this is a very revealing moment for me because no, teachers don't want to go to Africa. They don't want to go to you know, Afghanistan, they don't want to go to Pakistan. There's lots of countries around the world that teachers don't want to go to. In fact, we're, we have an international shortage of 18 million teachers right now. A total of 23% of all children growing up don't attend any school at all. And if we continue to have to insert a teacher between us and everything we have to learn in the future, we can't possibly stay competitive with all the demands that are, are coming our way. So when Christian Clayton, Clayton Christensen talks about 2019, half of all K through 12 classes are gonna be taught online, what he's referring to is uh, courses that are self-taught courses where, where students can actually work at their own pace on topics that they're interested in. And the other half of the classes are gonna be interactive social classes with, uh, in the school. So some of the future plans for the Da Vinci Institute. Um, some of you will see the, the board over here. We have this, this layout here. This is, um, we, haven't, um, we haven't put any money down on this. This is a new facility, which is on the other side of Highway 36. Uh, it's above Superior Liquor, if you know where that's at. This is a 28,000 square foot second floor of this building, and it's, it's very nice. Um, so what we'd like to do as a first step is to expand the Da Vinci Coders program. The second step is to create a learning laboratory so that we can understand how to, there's no one size fits all formula for teaching each of these new technologies. Uh, we have to figure that out. This is the messy front end of training people. To, and um, then the, the next step will be create a maker space for course creators. Um, so as an example, if we're teaching people to design parts for 3D printers, we're gonna have to have 3D printers there. If we're, uh, if we're gonna teach people to become brewmasters, we're gonna have to have a lot of beer. Um, <laughs> so what would that look like? We don't know for sure yet, but there's lots of ideas of what a learning laboratory would look like. And then uh, these maker spaces for cutting edge courseware uh, course creators. Um, if we're gonna do a lot of robotic stuff, then we'll have to have robots there um, attending to our every need. Um, so as Mark Twain says, a man who carries a cat by a tail learns something he can learn in no other way. <laughs> Boy, isn't that the truth. Um, the future is ours to write. I'm going, to, I'm going to end with a few predictions here. The Internet of Things will virtually eliminate theft. Well, actually, it's going to create a whole different caliber of criminal. Um, artificial intelligence is going to eventually destroy the entire stock market and will cause a new form of capital markets to emerge. I'm, I'm actually convinced of that. I, driverless cars are going to change transportation more fundamentally than the invention of the automobile itself. By 2030, the average person will own printed clothing, live in a printed house, have packages delivered by drones, own more than one robot, will work as a freelancer, 
frequently use a driverless car will be three times more educated than the average person today and will be capable of accomplishing 10 times more than anybody today. When I talk about over 2 billion jobs going away, there's a recent study done by McKinsey and Company that says that uh, every job eliminated by the internet creates another 2.6 jobs uh, in the online world. So I like to say the fastest way to create new jobs is to automate the old ones out of existence. So we're entering into this period of unprecedented opportunity. So why is this so important? Humanity is going to change in more in the next 20 years than in all human history. Risk factors are going to increase exponentially. So there's lots of dangers here. And our children's children who haven't even been born yet are counting on you. As Steve Jobs says, right now is one of those moments when you are influencing the future. And don't think you're not. But sometimes our best efforts just look a lot like this. <laughs> Pretty much just like that. As Thomas Edison says, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Isn't that the truth? So any of you that want more information uh, about the Visionarium process or how to get on our free newsletter, just talk to people behind the front desk. And I thank you very much for uh, listening to me tonight here. Thank you. <laughs> was remarkably well done. Um, and, I, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the first energy related video that's gone viral. Um, which says something, but it doesn't say it, it's going to be a good workable technology. Um, so uh, there's lots of um, ways that this can go wrong because it's really expensive. It is uh, uh, real high-end technology for a really abused surface that they ride on. So is that the best way to do that? I mean, we can absorb solar in and surfaces that don't get nearly as abused. So I, th I think there's, there's other ways to going about it that would be more, uh, more efficient than that. Uh, other questions? Um, Just talk about it, Dave. Uh, okay, Dave? Uh, it was a little faster at the end. It seemed like a contradiction. You said there's going to be so many jobs eliminated. Was it 2 billion? Yeah. And in the very next slide, said a study shows that for every job that's eliminated, two and a half are created. So is that yeah. Kind of so for for every job eliminated in the digital world, another 2.6 jobs were created in uh, in startup companies. So that's just in in the online world. It doesn't apply to physical jobs. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I should correct that a little bit there. Uh, Tim. On the geopolitical side, there's obviously going to be tremendous competition between China, China, Russia, and other countries to, I would think, have the best education system. Can you talk a little bit about what the race is going to look like? Um, yeah, there's, there's uh, two of the, the best uh, education systems in the world right now are, are South Korea and Finland, and they have radically different approaches. Um, uh, the students in South Korea work very hard to learn things and in Finland they take a very um, kind of laid-back approach. They don't start students till age seven, um, short school days, but they just focus just on the basics. So which is a better school system? Uh, it's going to continue to shift and as we get better at things like transcranial brain stimulation and uh, other technologies that are uh, showing great promise. Um, I think we're, we're going to see these shifts in one, one or another. But the, the demand for what we have to know to be functional in the future, it's going to continue to be very competitive. And, uh, and that's where I find it to be so interesting because it's not just um, kind of learning the basics, it's kind of shifting gears in your life. You're going to get burned out in your career after 10 years. You want to do something else. How do you do that? Where do you go? You're not going to want to go for two years or four years at a college. You want to do it in the least amount of time. That's where I think there's a huge opportunity. Um, other questions? Back here. The uh, micro colleges, 
Yeah. Other than the um, Da Vinci Coding Institute, are there examples in current society? Yeah. What? Yeah, when we started DaVinci Coders, we were the second school in the country to have that, that type of format. And since that time, there's been another 50 schools that have cropped up around the United States just in, in computer programming. Um, now, there's other um, uh, schools that teach things. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, G School is uh, another computer programming school. But there's other schools that teach people how to uh, do archery, there's people, how to become uh, auctioneers, and uh, there's lots of things like that. Um, but it hasn't been very refined. It's just real piecemeal stuff that's out there. Uh, so there's, there's no uh, transfer of credentials, if you will, um, and there's no loan programs that go along with taking these classes. Uh, so they're, they're kind of left out in the cold. Other questions? Yeah. If stock markets are going to fail, what's going to happen to the capital investment? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, so, yeah, she's wondering about the stock market fails, what's going to happen with all the capital investments. Uh, there's, there's a great concern about um, artificial intelligence uh, destroying a lot of things. And I happen to think that um, right now, uh, so many of the trades are already automated that we don't have a true reflection of what the value of these stocks are because there's very little human input in these decisions. Um, I think we're already kind of skidding off the rails with the whole system we've created. And the ability for some AI system to go in there and actually uh, throw it in total chaos, I think, is, is very high. Um, so what would happen with all your investments? Boy, that's going to be a crapshoot. I don't see a bright future in that. <laughs> um, sobering thought. I'm sorry. It's such a downer. Uh, I apologize. George? Well, if we look at through our lifetime, we've seen radio, television, internet. What's next? How are we going to communicate after a Wi-Fi? It gets so fast. How do we get instantaneous communication? Yeah, there's communication this. Communication of the future. Yeah, it's this whole retro thing. We're going to go back to smoke signals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, uh, great question. Um, I mean, we're going to be shifting from 4G networks to 5G networks. I mean, that's an obvious uh, shift that we're going through. Um, uh, there's several areas of Colorado that we already have fiber to the home that's available. Um, but uh, this idea of being more aware, and it's, it's kind of all of these, the details, the nuances in how we communicate that I think are going to be real interesting. It's not just kind of the speed and the devices, but um, uh, understanding the information in different ways. I think that, that becomes really interesting. Uh, I know that's a really vague answer, but it's the best I can do. Yeah, so Tom, let's, let's go back.